My name is Dan Fantasia. I'm the CEO and founder of Treeline Incorporated. We're recognized as the nation's top sales recruiting firm and known for changing the lives of over 3,000 sales professionals nationally. Hey guys, it's John Carsabai with Ivy Podcast. And Dan, thanks so much for making time to join us today on this uh, Wednesday morning. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. Tell us uh, where, where are you based at? Where are you, where are you calling from? We're based out of uh, Wakefield, Massachusetts, Excellent. just north of Boston. Okay. All right. Well, I spent a few years in Boston. I have a soft spot for, uh, for, for Massachusetts. It's a great, 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 great place. Um, Dan, before we talk about your current organization, your role and all of that great stuff, give us a thumbnail version of your career to date. Uh, that's a, <laughs> that could, that, you know, that's a, that's a long open-ended question, but I'll make it quick. Uh, <laughs> Let me see. I graduated studying architecture and environmental design. I spent my senior year uh, studying in Denmark, uh, traveling Europe. When I came home, I became a, uh, I moved to Wyoming. I worked for Jackson Hole uh, Sports. I was a ski bomb. Uh, when I finally landed back in Massachusetts, I started my career leveraging my architectural degree. Uh, quickly became uh, very successful in a CAD CAM company started running the organization. And at some point I got the, the um, conclusion that it wasn't for me. I went to a search firm. I interviewed at a bunch of different software companies and they said, hold on a second. What about this? What about recruiting? It was hundred percent commission, uh, but it was a good fit. I liked the culture. So I joined the company. I was absolutely horrible at it for my first six months. I mean, just a failure, um, but always worked hard. So I just worked my butt off within the, by the end of my first year, I was the number one producer. By the end of my second year, I was the youngest managing partner to be promoted. Uh, and then the culture just broke apart. So I uh, started Treeline in 2001 uh, to build a culture, a really healthy, dynamic, fun organization where we were, you know, uh, you know accomplishing goals and, and working together as a team. And ever since, uh, it's been a rocket ship. We've had a lot of success. Uh, we're focused exclusively on advancing the careers of, of sales professionals and it's a job that you you know you get you get a lot out of it. It feels really good to help individuals and corporations grow. Wow, that's super exciting! And thanks for sharing that. You know the the background of your career, quite diverse. Congrats on all the accomplishments. As far as Treeline, where you guys at right now? Tell us a little bit about the mission of the organization. Where do you guys see yourself in the near future? Yeah, I love that. Good question. Well, we. Well, as of a year ago, we, you know, we were a brick and mortar company, um, you know, big bullpen. Um, everyone came to the office. And uh, of course, when COVID hit, we left on a Friday. On Monday, we were saying it's not going to affect us. We're going to work through it. On Friday, we were remote. <laughs> and that following Monday, we never went back. Uh, so we voted as a company, as unusual that, as that may sound. We voted as a company, we decided to go virtual. And so uh, we had to stabilize. We need to buy some technology. We need to transition and pivot completely. Uh, and so in September of last year, we hired our first person remotely. So we've hired, in, uh, we've hired two people in Texas, uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, and continue expand to, to expand across the United States. Um, moving to a, a remote uh, organization was probably the best thing that could have ever happened. I mean, we were suit and tie every day. I was in the office hard charging with, with the rest of my team. And believe it or not, that actually stunted our growth. It stunted our growth because our biggest challenge was attracting and retaining talent in the Boston market that could commute to Wakefield, which is only 10 miles north of Boston. Uh, and so by going remote, what happened is we opened up to the entire United States. We have a bigger swath of individuals to, you know, to speak with and to recruit. And as a result, our team is just more and more talented and, um, and it's helped with our growth. I mean, right now we're just, we are, we're on fire. So all good. Knock on wood. Wow. That's super exciting. A lot of great progress. Um, I've, you know, and I see some, you know, awards behind you on the, on the wall. And recently you've posted a little bit about, you know, accomplishments, share those with us. Uh, and to, you know, what do you attribute that success to? Yeah, Forbes just recognized us as one of the top 200 uh, best professional executive search firms. So that was pretty cool. Uh, Inc. Magazine just recognized us as one of the best places to work. Uh, you know, we're, we're typically 
we're always ranked uh, as a as a best place to work. The BBJs, you know, we're usually between one and three ranked either number one, two, or three as one of the best places to work in Boston. So that's awesome. Uh, Inc. Magazine has picked us up across the United States, so that's pretty cool too. Um, you know, we've been Fast 50, Inc. 5000, fastest growing company. I mean, all of that, um, all of that success is basically just due to an awesome team. We hire really good people. Uh, we're completely transparent. There, we are really good communicators. Um, you know, there is, you know, no st stone left unturned. I mean, you ask a question, you have an answer, and everyone contributes. They're all part of the company and the team. And when we're on the same page, we're all rolling in the same direction, and it it makes it a lot easier to grow. You know, uh, both profitably and and successfully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's super exciting. Um, so with the focus on sales, recruiting, sales training from that perspective, what are some of the trends that you've seen in the current market? What are you most excited about that you're researching that, you know, you believe will be the next big thing in the space? Yeah, cool. Uh, well, there's, there's a couple of questions there. So, so we work at both candidates and we work with both companies, right? So there's a different perspective. Well, I, in some instances, there's, there's a different perspective as to where we're going, you know, and in, in the job market. Um, when it comes to technology and where our where our industry is going, I mean, I, you know, I was I was excited about artificial intelligence, and I still am, but not as much as I am excited about video communication. Right now, the ability to communicate effectively virtually, I think. Uh, I think the technology is developing and it's just going to get better and better and better so that when you communicate, it's more of a real life personal experience as opposed to, uh, you know, virtual, just because we're so, everyone now is so used to working nationally and internationally, you know, we need, uh, we continue to need um, better ways to communicate. So I, I, I'm excited about video and, you know, communication like this. I think it's just awesome. Um, when it comes to where the market's going, um, I can tell you this, candidates want to be virtual. That's it. Maybe, maybe they, they'll consider a um, hybrid, but they've worked successfully in a virtual environment. And so what's happening is some companies are trying to pull candidates back or employees back to the office. And those candidates or those employees, they're calling us saying, I know I'm going back to the office in the fall. And as a result, I want to start looking for opportunities that are virtual. And companies, on the other hand, a lot of them have adapted to virtual environments, but we still have a lot of companies that they refuse. They, they want back full time now. And we are struggling to drive candidate activity and traffic for those companies because that's the number one thing candidates are saying. I don't, I'm not going back to the office. Let me talk to the three other software companies that would consider my background. But that one, I, I just don't want to talk to. So we're seeing from an employee perspective, they want to, they want flexibility or at least ver they want some kind of hybrid from a corporate standpoint. I think a lot of companies, they're paying leases, they have space. And I know it would be happened to us too. If, if, uh, if we didn't go virtual and the timing happened to be perfect when our, when our lease extent, when our lease expired, um, we probably would be pushing people to come back to the office because we were paying for it. But hopefully companies can get past that. And as their leases ex, you know, expire, they can move to a, a fully you know, virtual environment. We'll see. I don't know. Who knows? Right, right, right. No, yeah, those are interesting observations and very you know, unique times we're in. So it's going to be interesting to see how things play out in the next short period. Yeah. Um, switching topics a little bit, focusing more on your, your expertise, your, your niche area of sales. Um, what are some of the most common misconceptions that you encounter uh, on, you know, on frequent basis when it comes to uh, building a sales driven organization? Because, you know, at the end of the day, sales is king and it's, you know, surrounding yourself and building an environment where sales folks can, you know, can succeed. I think it's of utmost importance for a lot of, you know, executives, whether technology, marketing or whatever the case may be. Share your thoughts on that. What are some of the pitfalls to avoid? What are some of the, you know, common mistakes that you see as organizations try to embrace and build that culture, uh, the sales driven culture? I think the number one, um, I think the number one misconception is you hire someone that has industry expertise 
uh, domain expertise. They walk in the door and they make your company double in size. You don't just, you, you can't just hire, put them in, put a salesperson in place and expect magic. Like it's just, it's all going to be awesome. You know, you still need management. You need strategy. You need execution. You need support. You need activity metrics. You know, you, you need all of the above. You still need to understand how your sales process works, um, what the metrics of success are, and then you need to be able to hold your team accountable. You can't just hire someone and say, okay, great, I got the salesperson, they're ready to go, they're gonna do everything for me. It doesn't work like that. Those organizations tend to fail because they do not have enough structure for the sales rep to understand what is required to be successful and as a result, be held accountable. Right. If they don't, if, if there is no understanding of your metrics and your model, I, I just it's 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 very hard to, to build a successful sales team. You know, that 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 is a challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, the second thing I'd say is, you know, sometimes people end up just hiring, you know, the best of the worst because they just can't drive enough traffic or activity to their own job. So, you know, what we do to help companies is, uh, you know, we have, a, we have a variety of different solutions, but one of them is a contingency solution, which costs nothing. What's nice about that solution is why not try it? Because we'll drive you candidates. And if our candidates aren't better than the ones you're seeing on your own, then don't hire them. It costs you nothing, but they will be, they're going to be better. And when you see t- real talent, real sales talent, then you can really build, um, you know, uh, an, an organization of success. But if you end up just getting a few candidates that come in the door and you just hire the best of the worst, you don't build a top-notch national sales organization. Um, so, so my recommendation is uh, make sure you drive a big enough pipeline. And then the third thing is sell. <laughs> sell your company. You know, uh, for organizations that know how to recruit salespeople, they're excellent at getting them excited. For companies that don't, they're excellent at turning off salespeople. They're, they're, you know, they're, 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 they want the salesperson to jump through hoops and tell them why they want their company so bad that they forget that this, this individual is also considering working for their competitor, for example. And if the competitor is selling them on why they're so great and why it's such an awesome opportunity, the sales rep's going to go to that company. So if you don't have an executive team, if it's not from the leadership down that's saying sell our organization and get people excited, you're not going to win the talent. You're just going to get the people that hang around, the C players that kind of can make it through your process finally and get the job. All the A players, they're on to the, you know, your competitors and everyone else because they're moving so fast. Right. No, absolutely. That's an interesting dynamic. Um, when, when, as you, you, you've mentioned, you know, you kind of, you collaborate on both spectrums of the side equation where you deal with, you know, the hiring organizations and also the candidates from both sides as you prep both for, let's say, that first interview, you prepare your hiring manager on, you know, the, the interview strategy, and then you prepare the candidate on the other side. Uh, what are some of the things that really help you succeed in that space to increase that batting average, to make sure that both sides have very positive and great experience through that interview process and making sure that you have that framework for, you know, a dialogue, that two-way street conversation? Yeah, the for, for so from the company perspective, number one, get make sure you can get people excited. Number two, set accurate expectations. And when I say sell the opportunity, I mean talk about all the good things. I, don't oversell it. Right? <laughs> don't oversell because you know uh, we're trying to help you build a sustainable sales organization. So for us, we you know we've been around for twenty years. Um, what we care about is we care about working with good companies and good candidates, and then we care about putting a good match together. And if for some reason there is a question on the candidate or the company. If we don't think it's a good fit, then don't, don't, don't hire the person. I'd rather just keep building pipeline and finding other great candidates until you find the right fit. Because I, I don't want to use my, you know, I don't want to burn my reputation talking to one of my, uh, you know, candidates that I've known for years, highly recommending your organization, right? They're, they're happy in their role. They're doing well. They're finding success. Uh, I disrupt their career. I highly recommend your opportunity and they only last six months or eight months. That, that's not success for me. So if, if for any reason we're, we're not thinking this is a good fit, then let's not do it. Let's continue to search until we find the right fit. Um, so let's make sure that we can sell people on the opportunity. Uh, don't oversell them. And let's talk to them about what's good and bad. 
So when the salesperson starts up the organization, you know why the company's so awesome. And you also know what the challenges are going to be when you get into the company so that there's no surprises, right? If there's no surprises, then you know the good and bad and you know how to fight through that first year, two years, three years, but at least you know what you're getting into. Let's be as upfront uh, as, as possible and make sure that we're transparent and people know exactly what they're getting into. And then lastly, set accurate compensation plans, um, please. If you tell someone you're going to make a certain amount of money, they expect to make that money. If it's unrealistic, then you're going to lose them in 12 months because if they can't pay their bills because you oversold them on a comp structure that no one's gotten to, what's the use? Like just set accurate expectations so you can find good people that are going to stay with you for the long term that can help you build a sustainable future. So that's what I would recommend for, for clients. Yeah. Um, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, those are great recommendations. I love that. Very unique perspectives because it's completely two different spectrums, right? The one is the, the who, who is the interview and trying to identify if this is a particular need for our team. And then the other side is trying to sell themselves as, you know, that particular strength that's missing on that team that they bring to the table, which a lot of common pitfalls I see observe, at least through my years of hiring, staffing, you know, my own teams is kind of more of a focus on that lack of weakness. Uh, what can I tolerate versus what is really the strength that's missing on our team that we really need to focus on? Mm -hmm. Can that candidate actually deliver that and how they fit into the cultural organization dynamics and things like that? So that goes hand in hand with what you were talking about. Great recommendations there. Yeah. Um, from a standpoint, so the market we're in right now, it's, you know, it's just, in, it's, it's insane. The war for talent is, it's unbelievable. Companies, you, you know, thinking that shifting to fully remote capacity would 10x your reach to candidates worldwide and things like that, but completely overlook the component of competition because now companies much bigger size, greater benefits and things like that also going after the same talent. Uh, so retention becomes a huge element in all of this, in this very, very candidate driven market. What are your thoughts on helping companies build an infrastructure or that culture where the top performance are retained there's you know really not a concern uh other companies poaching them yeah I, you know that's a t i'm not sure exactly it's it's we're just it's so new right now you know we um so it is true i, I we're finding that there's less loyalty loyalty the loyalty rank working at an organization is dropping <clears throat> and it's dropping because um if you are a virtual environment, if you have pivoted, you have an advantage, you can find talent across the globe. And so as a result, you know, employees are getting phone calls for roles and positions in companies that are everywhere. Um, and so if you're, again, if you're forcing them into an office, I would, I would expect that you're going to see a, s a substantial amount of turnover. Um, when it comes to retention, I mean, there's a, a lot of things that we do I and mean, we do, you know, we do daily huddles. So every day we, we start the, we start the day with a 15 minute quick huddle with the entire company. Right. So that, that's important. We also do, um, so what we call start, stop, stop keeps. So, 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 so again, back to the, the, the question was, I, I'm not sure the answer to that question, but I can tell you some of the things that we're doing that seem to be working re really well. Um, and, and one of those, again, is the daily huddles, the start, stop keeps, we're on a quarterly basis, anonymously, and the team writes in what they think we should start doing, what we think they should, what they think we should stop doing, and what they think we should keep doing. And so that's very helpful. Then we build quarterly themes and motivational fun things for our team to, uh, to run after. Um, you know, right now we're, we're going to, if, if we hit our numbers and goals, we're going to take a few days off before and after the 4th of July, we're sending out monthly gifts. We just had a, a, a virtual wine tasting, you know, so where, you know, we, 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 we mailed everyone, you know, cow bells to ring the bells when they help, you know, a new person find an opportunity. So we're trying to do as many things as we possibly can to keep that same fun, dynamic culture. But, um, to answer your question, I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure um what it's going to take for companies because we're still we're still learning as we go right right no and there's you know there's no formula for that it's a lot of also experimentation and at the end of the day how you know you treat your your teammates your your entire organization i think boils down to that 
Um, so from, you know, you, you've been in this space for quite some time. Obviously, you research a lot. You learn a lot. Share with us your sources for learning. What's your content diet is looking like uh, when it comes to, you know, your industry, your, your trade. What are you reading on a daily basis? What do you let your mind be exposed to? Yeah, you know, the, so uh, we, have a, we have a growth advisor. His name's Herb, Herb Cogliano from Aspire Growth Advisors. And, and he, he, I find that I personally, I'm so busy. I find that he is incredibly helpful, not only with business and growth and scaling up and things of that nature, but uh, he, 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 he constantly, um, He's constantly sending me information, content to read. So while I'll, I'll read, uh, you know, articles and things of that nature, books, uh, my team does the same. Uh, I, I feel as though at this point, um, I'm talking to the team, we used to do book reports once a month, which we haven't done in a while, but each person reads a book and then they do a book report and just to find out what they've learned. Um, so uh, we do, we do a lot of reading as a team. We share data. We do a weekly OC meeting where we can share a lot of this content. Um, and then outside resources, I think are helpful to continue to, you know, fill that funnel full of, you know, books and content that you should read. Um, one, one of the books, I mean, I have, I have a pile of them over here. Matter of fact, this was one, this was a good one that he recommended to me was the, uh, the five temptations of, 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 uh, of a CEO, which I thought was very good. And then this one was recommended by our team. <laughs> dad, dad jokes. I, I like to tell, you know, it, it, it doesn't always have to be serious, but sometimes, you know, to start our meetings, it's always nice to tell a funny joke. My team hates it. <laughs> they, they all look at me like I'm crazy, but uh, you know, every now and then we'll get one that hits. And it's just a, it's a fun, positive way to just, you know, be a little goofy. You know, you can be made fun of, but at least it's a, it's a good way to get started. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm not it. sure if I answered your question. No, no, I think you <laughs> I did. Think I you danced did. around it. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you did. It's a great answer. And I love the dad jokes one because, you know, personally, my kids are at that age where they still think my jokes are funny. <laughs> but I know that's going to change very soon. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 it does. But you got to still keep telling them. Keep telling them. So. <laughs> keep polishing that skill. It's I mean, getting right. better every that's day. Right. <laughs> that's so cool. I appreciate that. Uh, um, and from standpoint of like, if people were to find you to connect with you, what are the best ways to stay in touch with you if they wanted to get a little bit more from you, uh, or just connect in general, tap into your expertise? Oh man, me personally, you can email me. I mean, my, my email address is my last name. It's Fantasia at treelineinc.com, but you can always go to our website. It's, you know, www.treelineinc, so treelineinc.com. And you can call our main number. You can email me directly. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, don't hesitate. Reach out. I'm happy to help out however I can. That's super exciting. Dan, we can't thank you enough for your time today. Personally, learn quite a bit through this very short and insightful conversation. Uh, you were very generous with your, with your insights. Congrats on all the success. You and I are going to stay in touch because I love doing the follow-up episodes with all of my guests in about a year to see how much I've changed. We will revisit this conversation and see what did we talk about. Those things are still relevant or not. So those are usually a lot of fun. Yeah, very cool. I'm on board. Yeah, let me know. Awesome, Dan. Thanks so much. And we're going to be in touch. All right. Thanks so much. I appreciate it.